Right, this video is question one of the 2019 scholarship exam. Right, the diagram above represents the motion of a pair of discs sliding with only linear motion prior to the collision. Friction on the surface shown before they collide. Um, at the point of collision, shortly after the collision, the discs have the same radii made of different uh, materials of different densities. M1 has a mass of 3 kgs, an original velocity vector um, using Cartesian coordinates 2 and 0. After the collision, it's got 0 0.5 and 1 um, meters per second. M2 is 5 kilos, so it's heavier, um, and then it's got negative 0.5 and 0.5 initially. And they say show the velocity vector immediately after the collision. So I'm just going to put in general, hopefully this is, oh you can see that. Um, sum of momentums initially should equal sum of momentums um, finally. And this is true in the x coordinate system and in the y coordinate system, but they needed to be treated. They need to be treated separately. So we're going to go. Um, we're going to sum up the initial um, momentum, but we're going to keep our coordinates in their vector form. So we're going to have the mass is three kilograms. This is m1, um, and its initial velocity is two zero plus m2. And its initial velocity is negative 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5. And that should be equal to the final momentum. Um, well, no, this, this should be equal to the total momentum. Um, I'm going to just, this is going to be the total momentum. So then I'm going to like add all these together. So if you add all these together, you should give, you just go 3 times 2 plus 5 times 0, uh, negative 0 0.5. Um, and that gives you 3.5. Um, and now we go 3 times 0 um, plus 5 times 0 0.5, which is 2.5. This is vector math, which is, I don't know if they teach that in high school. I learned this at uni, but then again, I didn't really pay attention in high school. Um, kg meters per second, negative 1. Um, there we go. So this is your initial momentum vector of the system. Um, that'll be equal to the final momentum vector of the system. And then now we do, we're just going to, I'll just put this, where am I put this down here maybe? Oh, I'll check in the lower column. 3.5 comma um, 2.5 is equal to 3. And now this is the final momentum. 0 0.51 and plus 5. Um, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to go... V, V2 final, and this is in the X direction. Oh, I don't, know. I don't even put that because it's, it's, it's sort of implied. Um, and this is V2 final. Um, right, there we go. And now we can see we've just got a simple oh no, not linear equation that we can just solve for terms. Um, in other words, V2 uh, uh, final, and I'm going to put subscript X up here. This is terrible notation, but it's just easy for you to... If you'd like visualize in the video, I can see what I'm doing. Um, 3.5, um, and then we've got minus 3 times 0 0.5, because we got this minus this, and then and eventually we divide by 5 would give me that. Um, so I just check break around that, divided by 5 should equal 0 0.4 meters per second. And if you do that in your calculator, it totally does. And then we get V2F in the Y direction. And that is equal to, so it's going to be 2.5 minus 3 times 1 divided by 5 to get that VF2. So it'll be 2.5 minus 3 divided by 5. Um, and that equals negative 0 0.1 meters per second negative one um, and there we go we just showed that after the collision the velocity components of uh, m2 are 0 0.4 for the x component and 0 0.1 for the y component right show that uh, con show that the collision is inelastic and explain how the collision does not violate the principle of conservation of energy um, so now what we need to do is we need to I'll shift this over a bit if i can uh we see that we need to Find the kinetic energy before, find the kinetic energy afterwards, um, and then just compare the two. So I have, I'll just write E, 
k um, before before um, equals and this is going to be e k one plus e k two. This is kinetic energy of uh, was it ball one or disc one plus kinetic energy of disc two, um, and that is going to be equal to half um, mass times velocity squared. Um, so the mass is three. The velocity is now. This is where you need to find the magnitude of the velocity. So the magnitude of the velocity is just going to be the two vector components squared. I don't know if they teach this in high school. I just learned this. At, this is just vector math. Um, so you basically you because the, these two vectors they well these these two coordinates represent a vector um, out in space. So this one here is probably not a great example because it's just two zero. So the size would just be two. Um, but this one here it would go along half and then up one and the vector is actually from the origin to where it finishes. So the, the size of that vector is the, you know, if this was a velocity vector, would be that size. So this is why you're gonna use a square root. Um, so it's gonna be two squared plus, what did I have there? Zero squared, did I actually do zero squared? I totally did zero squared. Um, and squared plus, and this is gonna be half, times five times, what is this? 0 0.5, uh, negative 0 0.5 squared plus negative uh, squared, 0.5 squared, squared. Um, and that equals six plus 1.25, and that equals 7.25 joules. Right, I'm just gonna do the same thing, ek after, ek, um, after, hope we can see that on camera, yeah we can, is equal to E K one plus E K two half times three times, same again, we need to chuck it in the, we find the magnitude of that final vector, which is 0 0.5 squared plus uh, one squared, squared, because it's velocity squared, um, plus half times five uh, times, chuck brackets, uh, 0 0.4 squared plus 0.1 squared squared. Um, and that equals 2.3 joules. Um, and <laughs> anytime you have any sort of collision, um, you always, unless it's atoms colliding together, you always get energy lost as heat and sound. Um, so I'm going to say energy lost as heat and sound um, plus, I'll just put plus some rotational energy, rotational energy, because energy because it's a frictional surface, but it doesn't say there's no friction between the discs. Um, and when you, so when you do these questions, pays to read every single question on the whole entire page, um, or the, you know, read the whole entire question all the way through to figure out what the style of question this is. Um, so this is a momentum question, and I don't typically blend, when they're writing these questions, or when you're, when you're making these questions, you don't typically blend in too many um, concepts that are too separate. Um, they have sort of done that here, but it's still all it's still all motion. Um, so because it's momentum, you're going to be expecting to you're, to you're guaranteed to have the energy in there somewhere. Right. So we'll just move on to the next question. Um, describe and explain the motion, both linear and rotational, of each disc after collision, assuming there is friction between the edges of the discs. Um, so I'll just pause it and write it like I normally do and then discuss. Right, so I've said both discs will have constant linear velocity as there are, as there are no external forces. Um, this is kind of like a, so this is, a, this is an idea they're looking for. They're looking for um, no external forces, constant linear velocity, and the center of mass continues in a constant straight line or a constant velocity. This is kind of like a level three concept. Um, and now we need to think about the fact that we have, what do we have, M1 coming in like this, 
and M2 coming in like this and they hit and we can see that M1 will rotate clockwise and M2 because of conservation of angular momentum should, well will, rotate anti-clockwise. Um, so I said M1 will be rotating clockwise, M2 anti-clockwise. M1 and M2 will have equal size but opposite direction angular momentum. So you, you, you could describe it all but if you didn't link in the physics concepts you're not really describing anything. Any layman could probably describe that. Um, but what the, any layman couldn't describe is as the net angular momentum was zero and there are no external forces, uh, no, because there are no external torques. Um, yeah, I just chuck that, you always chuck this caveat in, always chuck in no external torques. Right, um, assuming M2 and, uh, M1 and M2 have uniform mass distribution, they didn't really get a, give me enough space, but what I, what I mean by that is they both have the same rotational inertia function or fraction or whatever. So like they're both, um, if one was uh, had all the mass the outside and one had all the mass the inside, they'd have different rotational inertias. So they would require different torques to get, so one could be spinning quite a lot faster than the other um, for the same angular acceleration um, and the same mass. So I sort of tacked it on there. Um, so I said, assuming M1 and M2 have a uniform mass distribution, they're just solid disks. Um, you've got conservation angular momentum, so uh, rotational inertia of the first one times its angular velocity equals rotational inertia of the second one times its angular velocity. So now, because we can cancel some things out, this equals mr, or this equals a fraction times mr squared, um, fraction times nr squared. If they're the same type of uniform mass distribution, that fraction cancels out. You just divide both sides with the same fraction. So you don't even know, need to know what that fraction was. Um, the radiuses cancel out because they both have the same radius. Um, I'm just shortcutting a whole lot of rearrangements, but I'm just explaining it. Um, and all you're left with is the two masses which are separate. And we know that M1 is three kilograms, and we know that M2 is five kilograms. So we get the relationship, um, the angular velocity of the first one um, is three fifths of the angular velocity of the second one. In other words, um, you could find that you could go, you could rearrange this, you put the five over there and the three over there, but this basically is a relationship between the ang two angular velocities. Um, right, next question. When the disks collide, there's a separation of charge as shown below. Um, oh, I can see that. I've already written the answer for all of it, just because I'm saving myself some time. Um, if the collision takes place inside a region of a uniform electric field, as shown above, describe the, how the motion of the disks might be affected before and after the collision. So I've already written the answer because I'm saving myself some time trying to make this video short. Um, so we have the disks inside an electric field. And electric fields are just like any other sort of, well, you can think of them analogous to gravitational fields. Sure, they have some subtle differences, um, such as if you have a charge moving through an electric field, all of a sudden out pops a magnetic field for no apparent reason. Um, but anyway, so I've, if the collision takes place inside a uniform electric field, describe the motion of the disks um, might be affected before and after the collision. So if you, you this is like a level two concept, um, electric field, the field lines go from positive to negative. So this must be the negative side, this must be the positive side. This is what you need to really remember. Um, and I said initially M1 and M2 are uncharged because look, there's no charge on them. Um, so the E field only affects the motion after. So it's basically I'm talking about this situation here, after the collision. Um, we can see this M2, so this mass here, will slow down and move off to the right. So it's going to sort of slow down because it's going to be attracted to the positive end um, in a parabola. And I've sketched that. Oh, we can see that. I've sketched that shape in. Because if they give you a box to sketch it, you better sketch it. Um, M1 will accelerate and move to the left in a parabola. I've also said... Uh, maybe I should have said decelerate. Slow down implies acceleration, but this is probably a more succinct description. Um, and move to the left in the parabola. So this one here is going to shoot off. Oh, we can see that. It's going to shoot off like so. Oh, there's my sketch there. It's going to shoot off like that. And it's, it's almost as if it was fall, falling under gravity. M2 would actually, it almost be as if you were throwing a ball up. It would slow down, reach the peak, and then start accelerating back the other way. Um, so it is. 